I, hey, let me set you up again. Guys, is there, is there something that excites you, you know, nowadays? A narrative could be anything. Yeah. The thing I'm kind of really uh, looking at a lot at the moment is is deep in um, decentralized physical infrastructure networks. You know, I think this is if you've if you've been sort of paying attention over the last few weeks and months, I'm sure you guys will have noticed that this is uh, this is a narrative that's gathering a lot of steam. Um, we did a video about it. We covered Masari did uh, a really interesting in-depth report on the deep in sector a few weeks ago, and we covered that in a video and. That for me was a sort of real watershed moment because I think, you know, that hit home to me, like not only that there are really promising projects in that niche and we can, you know, we can talk about some of those at some point later on if you want, but um, not only are there really promising projects, but also I think Deepin could be, uh, could be the way that we get the message of crypto to the wider world, you know, that, that holy grail of mass adoption that we're, that we're always talking about and that went very, very quiet during the, the bear market. Um, but, you know, deep in, I think, is something that not only brings, uh, you know, public goods, not only brings good services to, you know, good and useful services to people across the world, but I think for, you know, for, for people new to the space, for, for people coming to crypto for the first time, for people sort of taking their first steps to get to grips with blockchain technology and what it is and what it can do. I think this is something that people can easily understand. They can, you know, they can see how these things work. They can see the use case. They can see the, you know, the usefulness of uh, so many of these deep in projects. And I think that's going to be really, really important for, for onboarding new people to the space. And, you know, I think I think a lot of time when you when you speak to people or when you, you know, when people come to crypto for the first time and they see all these kind of weird and wonderful financial things that you can do, like, you know, all the stuff that you can do with DeFi. I think for a lot of people that really scares them off. You know, it, all this sort of complicated, uh, all, all these all these crazy things that you can do in DeFi. I don't think that's what most people are interested in. I think you know, similar to GameFi, people want cool stuff that works and gives them something back for their efforts. That is something that people can get on board with, that they can understand and that they can adopt. And that is why I think Deepin could be one of the big narratives of this cycle, along with along with things like GameFi as well. But I mean, we can get to that. What about I mean, what about you guys? Are you are you kind of in Deepin as well or are you looking elsewhere? I I'm, you know, obviously decentralized physical infrastructure are going to be a big narrative. I, I skimmed over Masari's report. I love Masari's reports. Mm -hmm. They're they're yearly, they're uh, yearly reports every year, and they're um, you know, different reports throughout the year. Um, gaming deep in, you know, my question is like, or like, what I think about decentralized physical infrastructure. I'm still trying to wrap my head around it because, as I understand it, it's things like helium, where helium had, you know, basically you could like get these units these uh you know physical infrastructure units from helium and you'd be part of their network and they you know they made a partnership with t-mobile and you know all of a sudden you know you could be part of the of the 5g network and even like get 5g and you know they would uh you know it would pay for itself in certain points not all the time but like uh you'd be part of the network that way and then like is like solana's phone that's physical infrastructure is that part of deepin or how do you like like for for those like who don't understand like why is deep in like why is that so easy to wrap your head around what would you say? It's a good question. Yeah, I think I mean yeah, I think I think you could you could classify Solana's phone as being uh, as being a kind of deep in you know a deep in project in itself. And uh, you know Solana I think is the is the blockchain that at the moment um, I mean there are there are new ones coming up on the rails, but um, Solana seems to be uh, targeting deep in as as you know one of its big sort of narratives, big use cases uh, for this cycle. So I think you could I think you could point to um, point to the to the Saga phone, you know, and obviously there's another one coming out soon, isn't there? You could point to that as 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 providing deep in, but it goes it goes a lot deeper. I mean. Um, you know, another another interesting aspect, I think, is things like cloud storage and data storage. Um, now, this is stuff that kind of hums away in the background um, to our daily lives. You know, Amazon Web Services, for instance, massive centralized company, a huge part of Amazon's sort of overall, you know, um, turnover. 
And it's, you know, that is storing people's data. Um, and, you know, uh, Microsoft as well, Microsoft Azure and things like that. Yeah, there, are, there are a lot of these sort of projects out there. The problem is that they're centralized and that comes with all those sort of inherent risks. And obviously it just funnels more profit into the likes of Amazon and Microsoft. And you don't and and we the uh, we the people whose data is being stored, we don't get anything really back off that. They just store our data and we have to trust them to to look after it and not leak it um, or you know let it get hacked or whatever it is. However, you know, um, there are there are a number of crypto projects. I mean, Filecoin is perhaps the the earliest example, but uh, we had other ones like Arweave pop up during the last cycle. We've got new ones popping up this cycle. Things like Jackal Protocol, Shadow, things like that. And you know, these guys are offering to store data in a decentralized way, and that comes with you know a whole a whole lot more security, a whole lot more safety, and it's something that you know we can get back from. We can uh, we can benefit from that as well. So, um, but this is you know this is the sort of physical infrastructure. I mean, it's it's stuff that people don't don't pay a huge amount of attention to normally. I mean, do you do you spend much time thinking where your data is stored? Pro probably not. I mean, I guess it's the sort of thing that m might preoccupy some people. But I think most of us just kind of go through life assuming that our data is being looked after. Um, it's also the same with things like computing power as well. You know, there's there's a huge amount of there's a huge amount of idle idle processing power sitting around, and there are there are projects popping up to to cater to that, to uh, you know, to 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 make that accessible as well. So I think a lot of it, I think infrastructure is is kind of is a key word there. And that, again, is why I'm kind of bullish on, on the narrative and the sector as well. Infrastructure, it's kind of dull. Like, we don't think about it an awful lot. But it's vital. It's so important. It underpins sort of everything we do, certainly online. And I think that bleeds out into the, into the rest of our lives. And let's face it, with AI coming up and, and uh, getting bigger and bigger and more and more powerful and more and more scary each day, AI is going to require huge amounts more data storage, huge amounts more processing power. And if there's a way to offer that in, in a decentralized manner that rewards users, then uh, I think that's a huge use case uh, in itself. Totally. I mean, the world is only getting more digital. And, you know, like you said, people don't think about where their data is stored. They assume it's being look after, looked after, but it could be more open, verifiable, private, all this stuff. We're really getting into the nitty gritty. Let's and Tina, you're welcome to answer a vertical you like, or we can zoom out a little bit and get to these big picture kind of topics. Yeah, I would love to. We can kind of zoom out. I mean, Deepin is a very, very, I love that guy brought that up. Uh, there's so much that I still need to learn from that. And I feel like we should hold a space that goes into detail, you know, discussing all the um, things that it, implications that it has. Uh, but I would love to start with, I guess, the question for the panel um, you know, you guys, with the launch of the spot ETFs, Bitcoin has been seeing significant inflows while gold ETFs have been experiencing outflows. So what implications does this have for the future of investment in digital versus traditional assets, in your opinion? Wow. I mean, that's amazing that, first of all, when the ETFs were launched and then the market dipped, so many of my regular friends and crypto friends saying, oh, I guess they were a bust. I guess they were a failure. And then all of a sudden, after a few days, we saw so much inflows, which even in very successful ETFs of the past, it's pretty uncommon to have multiple days of huge inflows. Uh, even the gold ETF, which we all we share that price of what happened after the gold ETF and, you know, the price shot up for years and years. They, you know, had mild inflows. And, you know, it's is a d direct correlation or people selling the gold through an ETF and directly buying Bitcoin? Probably some people, but probably not. But it just kind of speaks to the future is digital. Bitcoin is fundamentally like it makes a portfolio better. And, you know, I can't speak why people are dumping gold other than the future is digital. Guy, what are you thinking? Yeah, I agree, man. I, I, I wonder whether I'm, I'm always I'd love to be a fly on the wall when you have these investment advisors who are going out there and selling these ETFs to their clients, you know, having this conversation. It's like, look, you know, I, you've got a position in gold. 
here's what Bitcoin can do. You know, Bitcoin is digital gold. Here is why Bitcoin is better than gold. You know, you, you can transport it across borders. You can, you know, there, there are, you, you don't need uh, you don't need permission to exchange it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and I think. Yeah, I think these I think these investment advisors and these these sort of invest or traditional investors, if you like, uh, are waking up to that and thinking, well, you know, why not? Why not have some of it in digital? Why not have a uh, a means of, tra of of transporting wealth how I see fit across the world if needs be? I think uh, you know, it's it's a fairly it's a fairly easy thing for them to grasp, and uh, I think it makes it makes perfect sense for them to do it. Obviously, I'm biased, but. <laughs> the people don't want gold guy they want crypto they want digital currency <laughs> digital store value one of those moments that you know is gloatable <laughs> as crypto users um you know charlie munger of berkshire hathaway had made a comment about bitcoin calling it rat poison and um I love seeing that, you know, Bitcoin actually has now a bigger market share than, you know, Berkshire Hathaway. So it's just one of those moments. I would use the example Warren Buffett. I would use the example Warren Buffett, rest in peace, Charlie Munger, investing legend. Yeah. <laughs> that was like very awkward for a second. <laughs> That's Aaron for you. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but hey. let's let's get more specific since we're on the topic of Bitcoin. I'm gonna be outrageous, but do you guys think that Bitcoin can two X to hundred K before the halving? Ooh. Just a measly two X. <laughs> we don't we don't deal in two X's anymore. That's that's uh, that's traditional. That's tradfi now. We're we're bigger than that. Um, before the halving, I I mean, on the way it's been going uh, the last few days because I think it was in uh, Coin Telegraph that I read yesterday that the crazy stat that in their first three weeks of trading, the ETF saw forty two K Bitcoin. Uh, inflow worth of inflows, which two point three billion dollars or, or so much, and then this week, this week, which bear in mind isn't even over yet, it was forty three k Bitcoin. Um, so suddenly, uh, this demand seems to have spiked, and you know, obviously that is going to make that is going to make headlines beyond just crypto. So, I mean, I generally try and tend to be, to, to, to be more uh, on the conservative end of the spectrum because I mean we've seen you know we've seen so many dips and corrections before and I, I think you know this talk of Bitcoin getting to 100k I think it's I think 100k is inevitable um, it's just whether it can happen uh, you know the time frame is is what really matters to so many people um, 100k before the halving I wouldn't have said I wouldn't have said that was possible a couple of weeks ago now I think there's, I think there's a decent chance, but I would temper that and say that we could, you know, we could of um, we could see these these inflows tail off. Uh, there's always kind of, you know, there's always risks out there in the wider financial markets, but it's certainly, I think at this point, it wouldn't surprise me if we got to that figure before the halving. A hundred k in like fifty five days, whenever the halving is mid April sometime. Wouldn't surprise me because everybody's just so bearish this cycle because everybody just got burned. And, you know, there's like there's plenty of reason to have a bullish thesis on not just Bitcoin, but, you know, crypto specifically. Honestly, though, I'd say no, no, no 100K in 55 days. Now, if Bitcoin broke all time highs like like that'd be, you know, possible and uh, crazy. I mean, typically we don't see Bitcoin break all time highs until after the halving. Um, so uh yeah tina what are you thinking yeah just just to piggyback of, of of kind of like what the data that guy was providing as well i mean yeah it's kind of crazy when you put it into perspective quarter of a million quarter of a million bitcoins have so far gone into these new etfs so on average that's ten thousand bitcoins a day being sucked into these etfs and only about 900 of them are issued on a daily basis and in 60 days you know it's going to be 450 so there's definitely going to be a supply and demand shock but um yeah i mean 100k you know i wouldn't be surprised at this point i'm not expecting it before the halving but um all-time highs however maybe we might hit all-time highs you know i don't know but 100k seems a bit high actually what do you think we have so Tina, those numbers that you just mentioned, um, there's 12 and a half more times Bitcoin coming out of the market than coming in. 
Like, that's why I'm super bullish to the cycle. I get it that people have been burned, but, like, the game's changing. The game is absolutely changing, you know, when financial institutions now have access to Bitcoin, unlike they had it before. So um, I would have said, just like Aaron, no, there's no way this is going to happen because of the cycles we've seen in the past. But, man, this is, like, a game changer. Like, everything is just turning upside down now. Like, it, it, not necessarily turning upside down, but just flying in comparison to what we've seen in the past. Like, I've been in this thing for 12 years, and this is the most fun I've had in a long time. So actually, with everything changing, you think even the cycles are going to change. So if we, if we break the 69K mark, how likely is it that you think we'll witness the end of the bull market within, like, the following 10 to 12 months that we're used to? I mean, cycles are going to continue to be the same, just like the same way that, you know, uh, the, the, the U.S. government fudges the numbers for inflation. We're going to fudge the numbers for the cycles and say that we're always right. It's just going to be an exponential growth. That's all it's, That's all it is. We're still going to be correct about whatever we suggested. Um, it's just going to be faster. That, that's all it's going to be. But, yeah, I mean, there's definitely a great chance of that happening. Um, again, supply and demand. I mean, this... This is not any like rocket science, right? It's like there's way more Bitcoin being bought up than I'm I'm mining right now. And man, let me tell you, miners are very happy with what's happening right now. Very happy. Yes or no? Rapid fire question. Just a few words. Answer. We'll go. Guy. Then action. Then Tina. Bitcoin hits 100k either this year or next year. Yes or no? Yes. Yes. 100 percent. Hey oh! All right, now here's a hard one. Um, you know what? It's you know, Bitcoin has Bitcoin's very bullish this cycle for for reasons that we we've talked about. But so it might not happen this cycle, but you never know because Ethereum's supply on exchanges drastically reducing the supply of Ethereum as well. Plus, Ethereum has deflationary properties. Do you think, guy, that Bitcoin stays number one, or do you think Bitcoin eventually gets flipped? Whew, that's tough that's tough to do yes or no um yeah that's tough you can say as much or as little as you want on okay that. that's that's good um i could i can see i can see a possibility of bitcoin getting flipped a lot further down the line um because i think a lot depends on on what ethereum's competitors manage to do ethereum has such you know first mover advantage huge market share uh, yeah, way more developers, way more active developers than any other project. So if if Ethereum's ecosystem can keep growing, if they can uh, if they can keep these updates coming and eventually get those gas fees low on the main chain. Um, obviously, gas fees are about to become a lot lower on uh, on layer twos and things like that. But I think you know if we can if we can one day make Ethereum itself usable for you know for the average person um then i think it would be pretty hard to stop its growth at the same time um what uh, the way bitcoin evolves i think will be will be really crucial to that as well i know there's the the digital gold narrative is very strong right now but we're also seeing you know we're also seeing uh bitcoin layer twos uh coming up now we're also obviously ordinals um, BRC twenties have uh, have changed the narrative around Bitcoin as well. A lot of people are looking to bring more functionality to that network. Um, if that takes off, that could uh, I think that could cement Bitcoin's status as number one indefinitely. But Ethereum is is going to is going to be a big challenger to it. So the question is, are the likes of Solana and all these other competitors out there, including including of course Ethereum's layer twos? Are they going to take significant enough market share away from Ethereum in the future? That, I think, is, 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 the, is the thing that will hold Ethereum back, if you like, from eventually flipping Bitcoin. But I, I think any flipping, if it does happen, is, is a very long way off. I think um, if, you know, back in the day, especially when the Bitcoin maxis used to be more prominent, prominent it was uh, hearsay to say Bitcoin could be flipped. But I actually think if it happens probably going to be no big deal and bitcoin could easily just like get right back to number one if there's like periods where you know ethereum just has a higher market cap than bitcoin it seems like that could happen for periods of time regarding uh ethereum getting like like you mentioned you know ethereum needs to get more usable totally 100 percent. and this you know upgrade going to make uh, uh eip uh well the the denkun upgrade eip whatever it is 
I'm um, going to make the L2s a lot cheaper to use, a lot more usable. I actually heard like the, uh, you know, the bankless guys and like the, you know, Ethereum Foundation guys uh, propagating, uh, you know, that Ethereum, the L1 Ethereum is going to be used just as a settlement layer for, you know, all the L2s and like, you know, an average person wouldn't necessarily interact with the Ethereum layer. That would just be the L2s interacting. I could kind of see that as a as a future, especially with this upgrade. And then with Bitcoin ordinals, I mean, just like for the straight, like picture type uh, pieces of art, NFTs, it makes so much more sense to have them on Bitcoin, in my opinion, but less programmable. I'm not a tech guy, so, you know, it's hard. Uh, Action, what are you thinking? No, ordinals are more programmable. Everything is on chain, man. It's not pointing to some IPFS. So like, I don't I don't think Ethereum is ever going to overtake Bitcoin, honestly. Like, And shout out to Dave down there. I mean, um, he's got the stacks going on, right? Um, it's it's just a matter of more utility being built on Bitcoin. Like right now, we're struggling with Ethereum to get anything done. That's why you see so many layer twos popping up. I mean, Optimism, Polygon, Immutable, like you can keep going. There's just so many of them because Ethereum is essentially unusable for the average Joe. It's just not, you know, the, the gas fees are just way out there. And, and I mean, and I, I do that have that love-hate relationship with Ethereum ever since I went to proof of stake, but that's besides the point. Ultimately, I think Bitcoin is here to stay and it's here to take things over. I mean, from ordinals like you're talking about, believe me, I love ordinals. And the my, maxis, uh, I think we're winning them over a little bit at a time. You know, ordinals are a good thing. I think that, you know, creating even more opportunity for people to earn uh, with the Bitcoin network with, you know, even with all the things that are going to take place in the next few years it it doesn't matter because the transactional volume is going to pick up the price is going to increase so we're going to be able to move forward with this thing not only for the next hundred years but for the next thousand years um and it's really exciting to see the you know not not the upgrade of the network but just the the new things that people are willing to do with it because it took a little bit from the upgrade until people actually started doing things with it you know taproot happened a long time ago with bitcoin and then it took a few months for people to go wait what if we do this what if we do that so there's a lot of things still coming to bitcoin and to think that ethereum or any other um uh, blockchain can overtake it is just to me it's ludicrous i mean you heard guy earlier talk about jackal jackal is what cosmos right like there's so many other layers uh you know blockchains out there that can be utilized for everyday use um jackal's doing um you know storage and they just launch radiance it's really stinking cool um there's partnerships all over the place taking you know taking place and it's just ethereum just another one but Bitcoin, Bitcoin is king. I feel you, man. I love it. I love the info. Tina, you go. <laughs> yeah, I love that. You guys, I have my Bitcoin position. You know, I feel like Ethereum ETF is inevitable. I want to know what's next. What do you think? Is it going to be Solana, Chainlink, something else? And I would love to throw it to Guy first. Um. I think uh, Kathy Wood was saying yesterday uh, that she believes that it'll be Bitcoin and and Ethereum ETFs and and nothing more on that front for a while. I kind of tend to agree. I think Ethereum ETFs are are, are pretty inevitable, but it could take they could take longer than than many people expect um, because there is still this, uh, you know, regulatory uncertainty surrounding Ethereum. And I don't think um, Gary Gensler and the SEC are in any mood to sort of back down on that. I don't think all the all the L's they've taken over the last year or so are, are, are going to change their position. So I think probably, you know, the idea of the idea of Solana ETFs or XRP ETFs, you know, XRP does have, I guess, some kind of regulatory clarity around it. But I think probably yeah, we, we shouldn't get too ahead of ourselves when it comes to uh, when it comes to other ETFs. I, I think Bitcoin and Ethereum will probably be it for the time being. Um, but I mean, I guess you know, as 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 the crypto as crypto's market cap gets bigger, as it becomes more and more ingrained in in everyday life, as it as it becomes harder to ignore, as crypto lobbying efforts become more pronounced in the United States and elsewhere. It's it's going to be very difficult for, for for regulators to stand in the way of what people want. And let's face it, if the likes of BlackRock, if if Larry Fink uh, decides that his investors want a Solana ETF, I mean, Larry tends to get what he wants. So who's to say? Yeah, for sure. Um, I you know I tend to agree that after the Ethereum ETF gets approved, there probably won't be anything this cycle i would think it'd be it'd be a lot harder because you know ethereum there is that question of regulatory clarity in the u.s but it's a lot 
better than some. And Ethereum ETFs are already approved in Canada and the UK, I believe, and maybe some other places. Um, but yeah, it's, it's just interesting to see how it's developing. Like right, like a few days ago, Kathy Woods, Ark Invest, um, just keeps uh, updating the application in a similar way that we saw with the Bitcoin ETFs, changing it to in-kind or cash redemption. And, you know, a big difference in the uh, a big difference is that, uh, you know, now they have to kind of define the, the staking option. And right now, according to our application, the Ethereum staking yield is defined as income. But we'll see, you know, um, Gary Gensler's, his term ends mid-2025. And here's the thing. A lot of people say the Ethereum ETF is definitely going to happen this year. Some people say, no, it's not going to happen until next year. Either one of those is fine. And actually, if they push it off a little bit, that might be better for the price this cycle. because. You know, really, it's the narrative. That's what I think. And audience, please go ahead and leave your thoughts in the comments. I am reading the comments. So if you have a good question, I will definitely bring it up and give you a shout out. Uh, what are some of the questions? But I, I feel like, what are, what are people I feel like so far, it's mostly promotions. <laughs> so I'm going to keep reading. <laughs> but I have a question for you guys. What's your biggest counter narrative? against the grain like unpopular opinion something that everybody thinks you know but you think differently let's make it juicy action let's go with you first <laughs> mm, that's a good one. Oh, you want to put me on the spot that way huh dude you um, missed your opinion i'm sure you got tons of counter narrative opinions opinion oh i love i love stirring the pot dude i think that you oh, most of you guys are already late to deep end that's a big narrative on my book right now. Um, I've been in the in, in, in this game for a long time since last bull cycle. I was like, "What's going to be around?" And I'm already in most projects that you guys are actually mentioning. So, like, I when, when you know Helium Mobile hit um, you know high. I mean, it was thirteen hundred percent in like a day and a half. Like, I, I took advantage of that because I was already in it. So we're just now talking about it. When influencers start talking about something, you guys might have missed the boat a little bit. You know, you're just catching the tail end of it. That's the biggest thing that people are like, well, we're going to talk about it on the channel. Like, to me, yeah, I'm going to talk about it on the channel because I want people to understand what's happening in the technology behind it because that's what I love about the space. But ultimately, you guys are missing out on the upside. you got to be at, like, I don't want to call it a degen move, but you got to be in here earlier than than me earlier than you know than the guy earlier than all of these people it's got to be a matter of like get in the weeds of things and figure out what's the next tech that's going to take over like you know um you, you kind of called me out last time aaron for for shilling timpy just because i'm like they're gonna they're gonna do the next google but that's what it takes like you got to go in and like really dig deep and find things that you believe in early on and stick to it right like tempe and jackal like they have a partnership going on right now and guy was talking about jackal so technically he's backing me up on my thoughts just gonna put that up. jackal is the deep in uh thesis jackal is the decentralized storage um decentralized storage on um uh what do you call it cosmos it's, they're doing a really good job and they're doing a lot of different products it's really easy to use cheap to use um, th there's just so many things out there and Cosmos has been like winning me over lately. I gotta be honest with you. They've been doing so many good things and I honestly cannot wait to see, um, how big they blow up this cycle because I got a lot of money riding on it. <laughs> and then like, I loved, uh, like, I, I would love to hear your, uh, just thesis on deep in and just a few sentences, help, help the audience understand it more. Um, deep in can be very complicated for when people try to nerd out but honestly all it is is for you to put devices to work in a decentralized manner that helps other people that's all it is so your phone can be part of a deep end network if you're sharing something with it right if you're mining with it it can even like deep end can really be, even be mining um you got to be very careful with how people pitch that um so it, there are a lot of different layers to deep end the one that is really picking up right now is going to be the decentralized net infrastructures that are sharing the Data, the ones that are connecting devices those are the biggest ones that you want to pay attention to in this cycle so peak for example they're doing a really good job and you, you know who's doing well if you search deep in on like google or something and you see these pop up right up top like they're doing it they know that this is a hot term and they want to show up they want to be right up there so those are the ones that are doing it right um and, and from there here's a crazy crazy idea Take a look at influencers, and this is why I love influencers. Let's forget about influencers. Let's call it influential people in the space. Find out 
what influential people in the space that you like happens to follow those accounts and see what other types of accounts, deep end accounts, they're also looking into. That is the easiest way for you to find new projects without having to hear it from somebody. Like, I can't tell you how many times I found out about stuff because Aaron all of a sudden started following somebody and I just happened to be paying attention that you were following that Me? person. I'm like, oh, yeah, you, you. <laughs> I only follow the best people, Action, the best people. Exactly my point. Like, you got to pay attention who you're following. Like, you follow me. That's a good sign. Well, I, I appreciate that answer, Action. We are really deep in to this conversation right now. But the, the topic is uh, counter-narratives. Unpopular opinions, something everybody thinks. And maybe you have a counter-narrative, which is, you don't often say because it's against the grain. But Coin Bureau, let's throw it to you. Does that uh, trigger any thoughts? Yeah, a couple, a couple of, uh, if you like, unpopular opinions. Um, one, I think perhaps because we're in the, the crypto, the crypto and blockchain bubble, uh, and because we all, I hope, you know, deeply believe in in the principles of of, of decentralization, etc. Um, I think it's very easy to assume that other people feel the same way or deep down other people feel the same way as we do um, and this this does make me wonder and this kind of you know this relates to this relates to mass adoption this relates to the idea of new people coming into the space and being fascinated by these technologies the same way we are um, I do wonder whether the majority of people really care that much about things like decentralization and privacy is another one Privacy is, it was, I mean, privacy is kind of uh, part of the foundations of Bitcoin, part of the foundations of crypto. You know, the cypherpunks, they were talking about uh, internet privacy before anyone else. And, and it, that eventually led us to Satoshi and to Bitcoin. Now, one of the things that really disillusioned a lot of the cypherpunks and one of the reasons why Satoshi's white paper was received with a massive meh when it first, when it first appeared was that privacy matters very much to some people, but not to others. And I, th I wonder whether that might be the majority. So I think this is one of the problems that crypto faces. We are, we, the, the, the industry itself is building amazing projects, which, are, which are, have so much potential and really could shake up the world of Web2 and take, you know, take ownership and take profiteering away from these big Web2 companies. Great, in theory. The question is, does the man or woman in the street really care that much? Does, do they care that much to adopt these uh, projects, to use them? Do they care that much about, uh, you know, about privacy and things like that? It's, it, it is something that, that, that keeps me up at night a bit because I think in order for us to get this mass adoption, in order for crypto to be, and blockchain to become part of daily life, People have to, you know, people have to kind of believe in its potential. At the moment, uh, a lot of a lot of the excitement being generated by by the crypto space is because number go up. Uh, people are seeing an opportunity to make money, which is great. But it needs to go beyond that if it's to really become a thing. If you know a two trillion market cap, that's amazing. But in the grand scheme of things, it's nothing. Um, so we have a very long way to go. Do people care enough uh, to make this a non-speculative market? That's that's something I wonder. Aaron, don't be shy. What about you? Do you have a hot take? Hey, guys. Uh, yeah, just to, yeah. Give, just to give a background on myself, I'm a communications engineer. Um, actually, and G, you were not called on. You were not called on. <laughs> But you're welcome to speak now. Go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, Action knows me. Um, my background is in communication. <laughs> don't 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 throw me under the bus, King. Actually, that's okay. Right. Yeah. Okay. okay. I'll, 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 I'm actually a big fan of Deepin, but I'm also one. I think I'm also one of the, its biggest criticizers. My background is in communication theory. I um, helped design one of the biggest networks for 5G in the United States, and I have a couple patents in the 5G sector. So. Um, I will tell you, like, Deepin is actually really big. I don't know if you guys remember a couple of years ago, like, you had those Hong Kong riots and, like, people couldn't text, right? And then there was a sudden, like, wireless network put up with a bunch of cell phones doing Bluetooth, right? 
that was Deepin. That was actually a crypto project that became later, like four years later. So, and what? Shill it, shill it, shill it. I'm not going to shill. I don't, I don't, I don't shill nothing. So, but also, like, as a communications engineer, like the biggest, the biggest expenses we have is real estate and electricity. Um, that's about like 40 to 50% of our costs. And like decentralized wireless networks actually put that, like that cost structure onto like, um, the individualized user in exchange for tokens. So that's important. Right. And these are where like these cost saving mechanisms and these like decentralization methods, uh, creates value. Now on the counter edge, right? Another part of my job is like, I testify in court for like bad guys, right? Certain deep in applications, I, I know for certain is illegal. And like, for example, sharing your data, um, people say they filter it, but, um, <clears throat> Most times it's not filtered correctly. And like when the cops come coming, uh, these decentralized organizations don't have your back. So that's something you have to take in mind. Yeah, what is the takeaway from all this? What is the point we're trying well, to make? I, I'm trying to say is that I'm trying to say is like Deepin, the Deepin has on tap potential because of the cost saving mechanisms. Like my company alone, we probably spent about $5 billion in like electricity and real estate costs. Now, could you imagine that in the token? Uh, like that's where like these cost savings, you multiply by like three because there's three US carriers. You multiply by 50 because there's probably 50 carriers in the world and you, and you start to see like how big these market caps can get to. But like when we start, we have to ask ourselves, um, am I okay getting paid for something? And I'm giving up something in return, you know, and that could be your access to your ISP. That could be your own personal information. So it's a very thin razor line. What I really like to see is, um, and I think it's the safest is machine to machine, which is like in the age of AI, it, um, is like basically your car is talking to the streetlights, it's talking to your house, and all this data is transferring over a decentralized wireless network for very cheap. And those are like not as a uh, how should I say risky as is, as opposed that's to that's already happening for free. People are already taking advantage of us that way. Like that's Amazon, right? Amazon is doing exactly that. That they have a network of an IoT devices all over the place. If you guys did not opt out when you had the chance to, Amazon is using all of their Alexa devices. Hopefully, I triggered somebody out there um, to do exactly that. They literally built a network that is leveraging your device right now, and you're not getting paid for it. I don't know, guy. Are these it's paid actors? We've never had so many mentions of Deepin on this page. <laughs> like everyone that comes. It's hot. I love it. This is where we're talking about the hottest trends. I love this. Tina, we have about 15 minutes left, and we have a bunch of questions we could hit. Is there anything you really want to hit? I know, I know. Hit? We're running out we're just... of time, and I feel like, I don't know, I guess a good question to kind of wrap it all up and put it into perspective. How does macro play into your investment strategies? Guy, are you worried? <laughs> Uh, yeah, macro macro uh, forms a big part of of how I look at uh, you know how I look at things because you know macro has has a huge uh, impact on the crypto market or has historically there does seem to be at the moment crypto seems to be kind of insulated from it a little bit when you consider all the all the bad stuff that's that's been happening around the world and all the all the stuff that could theoretically happen um, crypto doesn't seem to be all that bothered by it. But nevertheless, I uh, I pay we pay pretty close attention to it here because I think you you know crypto is crypto is becoming more and more a part of the financial landscape and it will be affected by by stuff happening in the world. Uh, for instance, and I just I just say this as an example, if uh, if China were to go to war with with Taiwan. Um, we would see that reflected in all markets. I don't know how I don't know how crypto would be able to sort of quickly shrug that off because that would that would entail such a global realignment to say nothing of the potential for it to escalate into a much bigger conflict. And look, you know, there are these there are these concerns around the world. There are concerns over China and Taiwan. There are genuine concerns uh, that the situation here in the Middle East could get a lot, lot worse. Um, 
So I think if you ignore macro, I, I think you're putting yourself at a disadvantage. You have to look at it in, in, in that wider context. And of course, the big macro factor, uh, if you like, re in, the last, in the last year or so has been interest rates, um, particularly in the, in the United States and elsewhere. Um, and I, I say this all the time, but, you know, I think we've touched on the fact that, that retail hasn't, you know, that the man or woman in the street again, hasn't, they haven't come back to crypto yet. If we want a proper bull market, then we need new, we need new retail users to come flooding back in. If interest rates don't come down and put a bit of extra money in people's pockets that will find it, that can find its way into crypto, if people are having to spend all their cash on servicing their mortgage, servicing their other debts, um, which have gone up because of high interest rates, then then we ain't. They're not going to come to crypto because they're not going to be able to afford to. So, um, yeah, I think you have to you have to factor that in, and that's why obviously so many people are watching the Fed, uh, the Fed and Jerome Powell so closely because once those rates start coming down, then perhaps we can we can truly start to get excited. I do have to say I agree with you, and we do always see after the FOMC meetings, we see a little bit of, you know, fluctuations in the market, um, and you're right, the retail investors haven't even Googled what Bitcoin is yet, you know, they haven't even come in this space, this cycle has been driven by institutions, I feel like, by the asset and capital allocations, but um, it's all happening while retail and like the majority of actually even institutional investors aren't even here yet. So, you know, like I actually read something that was saying independent advisors, if you just took those in, not even the big companies, if you just looked at the independent advisor operating at their own firms, you know, um, collectively, they manage around eight trillion dollars in assets. And based off of the surveys that these ETF companies have been doing, three quarters of them say that they're going to allocate to these ETFs and their average allocations about 2.5%. So that's still huge, even 2.5% of that 8 trillion. And this is just the independent advisors. But just to play the devil's advocate on the macro question, um, I saw a tweet from Arthur Hayes that the other day that he was kind of like saying, why even look at macro? Because if you combine the Fed and the treasury activities, the net is basically an injection of $21 billion per month. So they're still actually putting money into the economy. And he thinks this is why tech, AI, and crypto are pumping regardless. because And they will continue to pump because it's all about the online economy. And I think actually, Guy, you were mentioning that earlier too. You know, it's digital online economy. Um, so yeah, just the different perspective to provide to the panel. <laughs> And, and Tina, like to what Guy was saying, I'll say the same exact thing and have a completely different point, right? Like we were just talking about the umbrella movement in, in Hong Kong, like how that stuff went crazy. Well, here's the thing. There was an upside to that revolt. Like there's nothing wrong with looking at things that are terrible happening in the world. And yet, hey, something good came of it. And Nodal was exactly what happened there. Like, we got really cool tech that came out of that desperate time of, you know, need. They need to communicate. And these guys said, you know what? We're going to figure this out. And they did peer-to-peer -peer communication just that way. And I, yes, Aaron, I did get the uh, Nodal word out there just, 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 just for me. The what word? Nodal. Nodal cash. Oh, okay. Well, here's the thing. Regarding Arthur Hayes saying, like, people are just onboarding online more and more. I mean, I agree the world is only trending more digital. I mean, whether that, I don't think everybody's going to get onboarded this year, however, and, it, you know, the market always dips when the Fed starts raising rate, but, you know, they're possibly cutting rates soon. Here's the thing, though. Arthur Hayes of BitMEX, a legend in the space, always so smart. Every, every time he gives an interview or writes a report, I always like read it. However, and maybe CH on our panel, he, he can attest to this. We were in uh, Singapore for Token 2049, went to the Arthur Hayes party, and I always thought Arthur was so smart, but we get to the party, there's not like one bottle of alcohol. I'm not trying to have the whole thing to myself, but literally there's hundreds of people at this party and no water. And Arthur Hayes is just buzzing around, having a good time. He probably had water. Uh, CH, you remember this? Absolutely. I do remember that. So that's actually wanted to say hello because, uh, you know, we all hung out at uh, his party. It was an absolute shit show. Uh, and yes, I can absolutely attest to, to what you were saying. <laughs> and it was like 100 degrees and super. It humid. was like, what, oh, what yeah. was that movie? Super X or something? I don't know. Um, but people were literally jumping over the wall to get in. Like the, all the walls was like swarming with people just trying to like climb the wall and get in. And yeah, no water. Just consider. 
Yeah, it honestly is one of the, the craziest, like most hectic parties I've been to. Uh, it was awesome to hang out with you guys, but honestly, in terms of like order and chaos, I mean, you, it was hard to top that. <laughs> totally. Any, what, what do you, what, anything else, CH? What are, what are your thoughts on the market now? Yeah, actually, it's it's funny uh, with a guy saying about the Taiwan-China relationship as I am driving my car in Taipei City, uh, listening in here. Um, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, this is actually what uh, Paul, Raul Paul talks about in his Everything Code. Uh, I think it all comes down to really liquidity, right? Crypto is liquidity. If you're talking about, um, you know, macro, these things are all very, very important indeed. But at the end of the day, it's about how much liquidity is actually in the market. And the Fed controls that, right? Um, and they have to print in order to service the debt that is just uh, at a ridiculous, unsustainable level. And with the elections coming up, you know, they the leaders love to... Uh, have stimulus, right? They, they love to say, oh, the economy is so great. You look at this, all this free money, you know, vote, vote for me. Uh, and of course, the U.S. election coming up in November. So I think with all these catalysts uh, and of course, Bitcoin having coming up, I am pretty bullish this year, um, you know, but it's still, I, I just think it still comes down to what the Fed is doing, the central banks all around the world. What are they doing with their money printers? Are they going to be turning it on uh, excessively? then we're really going to see crypto start to really go to these astronomical levels. Just my two cents. Excellent. Excellent. I just want to know, Aaron, is it April? Uh, nope, it's February. Did April Fools get moved? Because I'm reading the anti-crypto queen Elizabeth Warren honored Satoshi Nakamoto for the 15th anniversary of the network's launch. Like, what? Yeah, what was up with that? I think that was... she. Somebody's getting fired on her team. <laughs> is she trolling or is this a political play, do you think? Because elections are coming up. I don't know. I would say clerical error. And she would have never known that if she was uh, diligently looking at everything that passes on her desk. I mean, I'd look at that signature closely and see if it's just a stamp. But that's... I don't know. What, what, what do you think, uh, Coin Bureau? Yeah, I, I, I saw, saw something about this out of the corner of my eye. I have a sort of visceral reaction to the words Elizabeth and Warren um, that make me sort of run away and throw up. So uh, I haven't really followed this too closely, but yeah, I mean, it looks like it looks like another intern. It's, got it's, just honor it's, it's basically a piece of paper that's honoring Satoshi Nakamoto, right, Tina? I mean, or they like, like waved the flag over the Capitol and then they gave him the certification that says that they did this. If you're a page, they do this for you as well. At the home. Uh, when I was an intern, you, they basically do this for everyone. It's not that big of a... Oh, so this is nothing. It, it's it's nice. It's like a nice memorabilia. So basically, if you work for a congressman, they will give this to you as a, a departing gift, like when you finish your like internship or when you finish working for them. Um, so Satoshi Nakamoto got honored with Congress's lowest honor. I mean, yeah, like it's like an, it's like a watch they give an employee. I, I I mean, it sounds fancy, but it really is not. It literally, they take the flag up, they hoist it there for five minutes, and they bring it back down. I'm, I'm like, dead ass serious. Like, I have one. I mean, too. I don't think I have an issue with the ceremony. <laughs> I'm just, I just have an issue with Elizabeth being the person behind this. But you know what, guys? I'll never forget where she stood on crypto. I don't care if this is for political prey or whatever. We'll never forget. Aaron, we're coming up on the hour, so I guess we can move on to final thoughts. Let's make sure if anybody has a hot take, any final thoughts you want to give us, let's give the panel like five minutes. What do you think? Sure. Any hot takes, guys? We need never forget Elizabeth Warren ribbons that we can pass around in crypto. Dave, what's going on with you? What's up, Aaron? What's hey, up, Tina? Dave. What's happening? What's happening? Um... I guess hot take. I mean, you guys were kind of talking about it, believe it or not. It was the deep end st uh, strategy. Oh, God. And, and wait, wait, hold on. Hardly a hot take. Well, not, not so much overall deep ends. I'm going to give you the actual coin that you can actually purchase. Well, not yet. Not yet, at least. Um, here we go. It's Let's coming, it. right? Gaming.io, right? Decentralized data processing. Think about it, right? OpenAI just released today Sora, right? Text to video. 
think about the GPU usage that is going to like the demand that is going to go through the like how it's going to go through the absolute roof. These data centers everywhere around the world are not going to be able to just expand and add <clears throat> some sort of like an extension to it. You can't just add an extension to a data center. So decentralized data processing is going to be huge. And the biggest and the biggest consumer of that is probably like Hollywood between renderings, AI, I mean, blockchain, you name it. These GPUs are going to be powering everything. So this company actually had this vision a while ago um, and they're doing this stuff the right way. Um, they're starting off obviously in the gaming sector, but they have, so for those that know Render, R&DR, for those that know Render, let's, yeah. let's in one minute sum it up for us because I do want to get to final, final thoughts. They, got, they have about 50 times, the, or I think it's 50 to 100 times the amount of GPU, uh, amount of like GPUs that ultimately can, like when you're essentially using GPUs in a decentralized manner, this is how you're going to get gamers paid. This is how I'm going to get paid. You're going to get paid for just using the GPU, like the unused GPU usage on our computers. Gaming.io, G-A-I-M-I-N.io. Appreciate that, man. Appreciate the alpha. Um, let's start with the Coin Bureau. Thank you for being our special guest today. Uh, pleasure to have you on. I'll give my final thoughts in a sec. But, you know, final thoughts. Feel free to plug anything you want. Coin Bureau, tell us what's next for you. Anything you want to want to say. Thanks, man. It's been it's been a real pleasure to be to to be here today, um, and I appreciate you guys uh, doing the space so late your time. I always forget that you're twelve hours behind us here. So, um, yeah, thank you for that. Thank you. I, I'm a morning person, so if this was being held in the evening my time, <laughs> you'd have got even less sense out That's of me good. than than you did today. Um, final thoughts. Gosh, I, I guess I guess it's easy to get. Uh, to get excited at times like this, and and with good reason. Um, but I think we, sh I, I think people should, uh, you know, continue to sort of exercise caution uh, when it comes to investing. You know, don't um, let's let's let the institutions, let's let them, you know, feel the FOMO and start uh, and start going crazy. I think, uh, you know, don't don't let FOMO and YOLO take over at a time like this. You know, it is still it is still a good time to be getting into certain projects, but make sure you're still doing that research, make sure you're still digging deep um, before aping in because at times like this, it could, it could continue to go up, uh, but it could just, we could just as easily see some, some corrections as well. Um, there is still, there are still a lot of bumps in the road. Uh, crypto is, crypto is crazy and, you know, very, very unpredictable. So exercise caution, but hey, enjoy the fact, uh, then that no one thinks you're an idiot anymore for being in crypto. <laughs> Finally, my dad's proud of me, you know, now that Bitcoin's up. <laughs> just kidding. But I do want to, my final thoughts, um, I just want to say, um, you know, Coin Bureau, I just want to give props and respect to you and your team. Every once in a while, I like to, you know, brag on Twitter about Altcoin Daily's accolades, you know, uh, number one or two in the U.S., top three in the world sometimes, but, you know, as far as crypto YouTube, but there's one YouTube channel that stands high above the rest and does it with such, you know, grace and uh, poise and just great information. That's Coin Bureau. Uh, so you guys really elevated the game when you came on the scene and, uh, Pleasure, pleasure getting to uh, chat with you in uh, the places we've met up at the conferences and stuff. Just much respect to you, guy. I really appreciate that, man. Thank you. Well, it's it, you, you flatter us, but um, yeah, we're a we're a hardworking team here, and like all of you guys, and like you know, like everyone making content in this space, we just we just love crypto and we love talking about it and we love all the things that it's going to do in the future. Um, so it's, it's a pleasure to do it. And, uh, we're, we're very honored to share the space with um, so many other wonderful content creators as well. We are just, we're just part of the overall makeup. Um, and it's, you know, it's great that there are, I think it's just amazing that a sector that is still kind of really so small in the grand scheme of things has so many people who care so much about it that they make it their, you know, they make it their life's work to talk about it and to bring it to a wider audience and to stay up late to do a Twitter space about it. I think that's amazing. So <laughs> we're really, we're really honoured to be a part of that. And uh, we just, we just want crypto to grow and more people to find out about it. And if you watch us, great. Um, but there are so many other great creators out there, not least Altcoin Daily. Um, so, um, so yeah, thank you. And it really means a lot. I'm, I'm flattered. Appreciate that. Appreciate that. Um, Tina, what, what do, you, do you have any final thoughts, please, as a host? 
Um, no, I mean, I do really appreciate you guys. Thank you for coming on. Thank you to all the speakers who came on. You know, you guys, while it's very difficult for most people to predict where the market is going, we're here today and, you know, every Thursday with Crypto OGs to put together a clear image of where we might be headed so that hopefully we can all ride the next wave together. So please give the speakers a follow. And again, thank you for tuning in. Um, is any, if everybody's done, I think we're going to end the, end the space. See you next Thursday. See yes, Aaron. <laughs> see see oh, you. Yes. No, I'm just really happy to, to be here with these uh, panelists. It was, uh, it was awesome to, to come on and speak with you guys. I know I met some of you in Singapore, and I look forward to uh, whatever conference I can see you guys at and, and connect again. So uh, much love. Much love to you, TCH. It was great meeting you in person. And yes, thank you guys. Until next Thursday, trade well, DGENs.